All right, in this section, we start talking about one of Go's comparative advantages, concurrency. And by concurrency, I basically mean doing multiple things in your program at once. Many problems in data engineering can easily be split up and be processed in parallel. Obviously, many problems can even be handled by a cluster of compute nodes that crunch on a problem in parallel. In this example, however, we limit ourselves to multiple CPUs on a single computer. Notice that Go handles most of the details underneath the hood. Even if you design your program to run parallel, it is ultimately up to Go to decide where to run your code. However, for this simple example, it is sufficient to assume that our toy examples scale well on a multi-core CPU. Before we start, let me show you how easy it is to do something concurrently in Go. For this, I want to start by creating a new folder inside the internal folder that will hold some function definitions. Also, I would like to create a new application file inside the command folder. So let's just do that. So let's add a new folder in the command folder. I'm going to call this concurrency. And the file is going to be concurrency.go. And same for the internal folder. I'm going to add concurrency, concurrency.go. Let's start by me showing you how to run a function concurrently. For this, head into the application file, create a main function, and then just do the following. So let's go into the main file. So declare our package. Remember, this is the main file, so we're just going to call it main. And we're going to make some imports. I'm going to need the format package. And I'm going to need the time package. Now comes the main function. And here I'm just going to do, I'm going to sleep for two seconds. And then I'm going to print something to the screen, which will be goodbye. All right, run this and you will see that this code runs in a procedural fashion. It will just sleep for two seconds, will print goodbye to the screen, and then it will just exit. Nothing runs concurrently here. So if we do this, I'm going to say go run command concurrency concurrency. Okay, so next we run the sleep function concurrently by merely adding the go keyword in front of the function invocation. So let's go back into the main file and just add go in front of the sleep function. Let's save this. And then let's run this. You see, no waiting, the function immediately exits. All you need to do to run a function concurrently is to add the go keyword before it. Everything else, the allocation to a thread and so on, is taken care of for you. Actually, what happens in the back is that Go is launching a Go routine for you, where it runs that function. Go routines are super efficient and you can spawn tens of thousands if you want. This is something you wouldn't be able to do with threats since things would become very inefficient very fast with that many threats. For Go routines, no problem. Obviously, the performance is bound by how many CPU cores you have. The more cores, the better. Okay, we have now covered Go routines. Let me cover the next building block for running concurrent code, weight groups. A weight group is pretty useful to make sure that your code does not exit while your Go routines still have important work to do. As the name suggests, it is used to make your code wait for stuff to finish. The way this works is that you spawn a weight group and every Go routine increments the counter of the weight group. Once they are done working, they decrement the counter. At some point in your code, you want to wait till the weight group has decremented to zero. This would be the point in time when your code finishes. Let's take the example from before, but this time we actually wait for the sleeping function to finish. However, for that we need to create our own implementation of the sleep function since we want to sleep and then decrement the weight group. We need to do this in one function since the decrement must happen once the sleeping is done. If we would do this outside the go routine, the decrement would happen immediately. Hence, open the internal concurrency concurrency.go file and let's add our own implementation, taking the time to sleep plus a pointer to a weight group. Try to understand why we are adding a pointer. 
If you don't know why, have a look at the previous video. So we go into the internal concurrency package. Well, it's brand new, so let's define the package. We're just going to call this one concurrency. Going to make some imports. And I'm going to need the time package and the sync package. Next, we define our very own sleep function. So I'm going to call this one just sleep. It takes a time to sleep, a duration, and it takes the pointer to a wait group, which is inside of the sync package. Then inside the function, we just sleep for the amount of time that we define. And then actually we're gonna decrement the weight group. So first we use the sleep function inside the time package as before. However, afterwards you can see that we are using the done method on the pointer for the weight group. Interestingly enough, the done method is called on the pointer. I assume ghost creators did that by design since weight groups are usually passed as pointers into downstream functions. That method call will decrement the internal counter of the weight group by one. Obviously, we also need to add one to the weight group. However, we do this outside the concurrent function. Now, why would we do this? Well, just assume the worst that could happen. The main function finishes before the concurrent code even makes it to the add method. With concurrent code, you can never be 100% sure when some piece of the code runs. Hence, it is better to be careful and just make the call outside the concurrent part of our code. Great. Next, we change the code in our main function to use this new sleep function. So let's just save this and let's go back into our main function. So I'm going to add some imports. So format, time, also going to need sync. And I'm going to use the internal sleep function. So my GitHub handle, name of the project, and then we're going to internal. And we need the concurrency package. Then we go into the main function. Let's get rid of this. So first things first, let's create a weight group. So we're going to initialize that variable. So var wg, which is going to be the weight group or a weight group. Then we're going to sleep concurrently. So first let's increment the counter of the weight group then let's run the internal sleep function concurrently by using the go keyword in front of it and we're going to sleep for two seconds and we're going to pass the pointer to the weight group and we wait for weight group So we say wg dot wait, and then in the end, just going to print something to the screen. Goodbye. Save this. So what is happening here? First, we import our internal function from the concurrency package. Then inside the main function, we start by defining a wait group. We add one task to the wait group, so the wait group knows that it will have to wait for one done signal. Afterwards, we use our own implementation of the sleep function and provide two arguments. A duration, so we will sleep for two seconds. Also, we add a pointer to the wait group. It is totally fine to not bind the pointer to a variable, but just to create one on the fly in the function call. We're not going to use the pointer for anything else afterwards anyways. Most importantly, we tell the wait group to receive all the required done calls. Until that happens, our main function will pause and won't exit. Now let's run that code. Obviously we would expect the code to actually sleep for two seconds. So let's run that code. And there you go. So obviously there is now no difference between running that code in procedural fashion and in concurrent fashion. But you can take what you've learned in this part and use it to spawn many different go routines and then wait for all of them to finish. Let's have a look at the last missing piece when talking about concurrency in Go, channels. Channels are a great way to coordinate all the different Go routines that might run. 
There's a great idiom coined in the Go community, which goes by don't communicate by sharing memory, share memory by communicating. So what does that actually mean? What if multiple Go routines handle the same piece of data? By this, we expose data in memory to multiple Go routines that might change the data in unintended ways. So instead of exposing a single piece of memory space to multiple Go routines, we can make the Go routines expose their data to us or other Go routines. We can do this by exposing data via channels. If you're familiar with Akka and Scala, you will see a lot of similarities. First, let's have a look at how these channels work. For demonstration purposes, let's define a function that takes a number, sleeps for a random amount of time, and then returns the square of that number. We have a whole bunch of numbers for which we would like to do that. So let's define that function first. So we go into the internal file again. Let's do some more imports. So I'm going to need the math module. And I'm also from math, I need the random module. And the rest is fine. So next, I'm going to define the squaring function. So I'm going to call this one square. It takes a number as an argument, which is a float, and returns a float. First, we got to define time to sleep. And remember, this should be random. So let's call this sleep amount. And this would be rent.intn to get a random integer. I'm going to add one to this. Then we're actually going to sleep. So we say time.sleep. And as an argument, we need to give it a duration, which is whatever the random amount is, as seconds. And we square the number. And for this, we're going to use the power function in the math package. So we're going to use number and rise it to the second power, and then return the result. So we're going to return the square. At this point, nothing special and nothing concurrent about that function. Note that I'm getting a random integer between 0 and 5 on the first line in my square function. I want to make sure that the go routine sleeps for at least one second. Hence, I add 1 to that number. Now we are going to change things a bit and I'm going to introduce channels to you. A channel is something you can send data to or read data from. Channels have a capacity and by default it is 1. That means if you write data to the channel, it will block until somebody picks that up. Your code will block unless somebody reads from it. The same way for reading. Your code reading from a channel will block until there's some data to pick up. All of this sounds kind of complicated, but it really isn't. So the very first thing that we will do is create a generator function. That function takes a list of numbers as input, creates a channel inside that function, sends the data into the channel via a go routine created and invoked inside the function and then returns the channel to us to read the data from. The whole point of this function is to get a channel that will contain the input data for our concurrent workers. It takes some data and just feeds it into a single channel. So let's do this. And I'm going to need some space. Oops, sorry. So this is going to be a generator. So it's going to be a function, which I'm going to call generator. And it takes a slice of floats and returns a channel and link floats. Here's the function definition. So first we create the output channel. I'm going to call this channel out. So make channel handling floats. Then I'm going to feed data into channel via a go routine. Now, bear with me. So for, well, I don't care about the index. I just care about the number inside that slice. So in the range of that numbers slice, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to loop over those numbers and I'm just going to send them into the channel one by one. And once I'm done with that, I'm going to close the output channel. And this. Then in the very end, 
we're going to return the channel, the output channel. So this code might seem a bit weird to you, so let's dissect it piece by piece. You can see that the function is a regular function, taking a slice of floats as input. However, as output, we return a channel. This is indicated by the chen keyword. Notice the arrow pointing from the channel to the outside. This means that the return channel is read only. We will only be allowed to read from that channel once it is returned. Lastly, we say that the data type for data flowing into and out of the channel should be float. You don't have to specify that it is a read-only channel, but it is a very good idea to limit the access to the channel to what is actually necessary. Next, recreate the channel and call it chout. This is done by using the make function, which we used in the past to create slices and arrays. We say that it should be a channel handling floats. Note that we don't declare it as read-only at this point. At this point in time, it is readable and writable. The next piece might seem a bit intimidating, but it's actually not that complicated. Ignore the first and last bit of that function for now. It then looks like a normal function definition, without a name. Within that function, we loop over the slice of integers and write them into the channel. Once that is done, we use the close function on the channel. This is something you should always do. Once you know that no more data is being written into a channel, close it. If you read from a channel in the loop, your code will exit the loop as soon as it receives a signal that the channel has been closed. In order to prevent our code from blocking, we need to close it once all the data has been written to it. And that's the entire function. Now let's look at the special pieces at the beginning and the end. Putting the go keyword in front of it makes the function execute inside its own go routine, or concurrently, to be more precise. Also, at the very end, you see that we immediately run the function. Hence, this entire function immediately starts executing concurrently in its own Go routine. I didn't even bother giving it a name. It's an anonymous function that executes immediately in another Go routine. Last but not least, we return the channel. Notice that declaring the channel to be read only in a function signature makes it so after it is returned. Now that we have our generator function in place, it is time to define our worker function that reads from the generator channel wrangles the data and then spits out the result. So we're going to create a new function. And I'm going to call this worker. So func worker. So it takes an input channel, which is read only, and handles floats and returns a read only channel handling floats. And here's the function definition. So we create the output channel first. I'll call this ch out. It's a channel handling floats. Then we handle the incoming data inside a concurrent function. Actually, you can already put this in here. So. Iterate over the input channel. So we read the data from the input channel. So for number in, in the range of the input channel. And for every number, we just square the number and send it to the output channel. So into the output channel goes the square of the input number. Once we read all the messages, we're going to close the output channel. Then in the end, we just return the output channel. This function follows the pattern that we already know. We define a worker function that takes a read-only channel for the incoming data. The function returns a read-only channel for the processed results. We then define and run an anonymous function that ranges over the input channel in a separate Go routine. All the incoming data is squared and then written into the output channel. Once the input channel is closed, we close our output channel. Lastly, we merely return the output channel. The last thing left is to collect the results from our workers. Hence, we need a merge function that merges the results from all the workers that we spawned and write it into a single channel. From that channel, 
we will read our squared values and print them to the screen. However, first we need to define an internal function that merely copies the data from one channel to the other. This will merely be a handover. However, we also add a wait group so we can send the done signal. So let's just create this internal function first. Let's just call this internal handover and I'm gonna call this function merge copy. It takes an output channel, which is read only for faults. It takes an output channel, which is a write only channel for faults. And it takes a pointer to a wait group. So sync dot wait group. Here is the function definition. And in the function, all we do actually is we are going to read from that input channel. And when we get data, we simply send it to the output channel. And that's it. In the end, we just call the done signal. Next comes the merge function. So I'm going to call this one merge. And notice that the internal handover function is private. The first letter is lowercase, so it's not exposed. You, you can't import it. It's, it's only going to be used in the merge function. This merge function as input, it takes a slice of read-only channels handling floats. And it returns a read only one single read-only channel handling floats. And here's our function definition. So let's define a rate group for the workers. So I'm just going to call this WG, which is going to be a weight group. And we're going to increment it. So this weight group, we're going to increment it by the number of workers that we have. And this will be, so you can see that the input is channels in, which is a slice of channels. And we're just going to increment the counter by what, however many elements we have in that slice. Then, we create a single output channel. So make chen float 64. And then we're going to copy the data. So for, well, I actually don't care about the index, but I care about every channel that I have in the slice of channels. Merge. Copy. We're going to use this internal function in a concurrent fashion. So we're going to run this in its own go routine. Use that channel that we're currently looping over. Use that output channel and a pointer to the weight group. Now I'm going to need some more space. Then we're going to start a go routine to wait for workers to finish. So go func, it's gonna be an anonymous function again, which we immediately run. And inside, all we're gonna do is we're gonna wait for that wait group. And then we're gonna close the output channel. And then in the end, return the result channel. Okay, so this seems pretty complex, so let's digest this step by step. So first, the merge copy function. Let me go all the way up here. All, the, all this is supposed to do is move one piece of data from one channel to the other. However, it also syncs with a weight group. Hence, we need to take an input channel, an output channel, and a weight group as its arguments. Inside the function, we loop over the input channel and simply send the data into the output channel. Once the loop has finished, we decrement the counter for the wait group passed inside the argument list. Next, have a look at the merge function. So here we have one argument called CHS in. It's a slice of channels. You might have already guessed what this will be. Well, I already told you, it's gonna be the channels of our workers. Next, we declare that we return a read-only float channel. Remember that the whole purpose of this function is to collect the squares that our workers return. 
Inside the function, we start by declaring a wait group. This will be necessary since we need to wait for all of our workers to close their channels, signaling that they are done writing. After creating the rate group, we create our output channel that will copy the data our workers have created. It is simply a channel handling floats. Then we loop over the workers' channels and run the copy activity inside a GoRoutine. This will get the data into the output channel. Most importantly, we use one copy activity for every worker. One last GoRoutine that closes our output channel. However, we only want to do that once all the data from our workers has been copied over. Hence, we need to wait for the wait group to finish. Then, our function simply returns the final channel. Now, if you don't immediately get what this function is doing, don't worry. It also took me some time to understand this concept. Anyways, let's actually get back into our application code and use all these functions that we have just defined. So, let's save this. Let's go back into the application code. And we actually don't have to import these. Let's get rid of this. And then we start by creating some input data. So th these are going to be the numbers that we want to square. So it's going to be a slice of floats. Uh, let's say two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, and 256. Let me create the generator. Remember that this returns a channel. So, and this lives in our concurrency package. Generator. It takes a slice of numbers as input, a slice of floats actually. Then we gotta spawn our workers, which will return channels. So first, I'm going to initialize a slice for these worker channels. So those will be, or this will be a slice of channels handling floats. I'm going to spawn those. So I want to have three. So for i, as long as i is less than four, and I'm going to increment i. This function returns a channel, so channel worker will be equal to concurrency dot worker. And as input, we're gonna use the generated channel. And then we're merely gonna append to that slice, that single channel. All right, some more space here. Then we need to collect the results. So I need a result channel, which will be returned by using our merge function, which takes a slice of read-only flow channels, which is the workers slice. And then the only thing left to do is actually block and print the results. So we just read the data coming from the result channel And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna print this to the screen. And that's it. So let me try to put this up on one. Yeah, there you go. So first I create some numbers that I would like to square in a concurrent fashion. I save those numbers inside a slice of floats. Next, I create the generator channel by using the generator function from our internal package. Having the generator in place, I need to spawn some workers. In this case, I want to go with three workers, but you could, of course, change the number of workers to, to your liking. I spawn those workers inside a for loop. Remember that our worker function takes an input channel and returns an output channel. Inside the for loop, I spawn a worker using the same input channel that was returned by running the generator function. Don't worry, only one go routine will receive a value from the channel. However, which go routine gets the value is non-deterministic. I take the output channel of the worker that was spawned and merely append that to a slice. Afterwards, I merge the results from all the workers by using the merge function in which I pass the slice of channels that results from spawning workers. It returns a single channel that bundles the output of all the worker channels. Lastly, 
I merely loop over the values that are being sent to the result channel and print them to the screen. Once the channel gets closed, we leave the for loop and the program ends. And this is all to our concurrent program. Point taken, this isn't a super useful use case, but you can use this as a blueprint for all your concurrent needs. So let's run this and see how the results come in in a random fashion after a random amount of time. Exactly what we wanted. A random order because they sleep for a random time. Some come in faster, some come in later. I guess this was the part which is hardest to grasp. However, this pretty much covers all the basic building blocks of Go that I wanted to show you. Hence, it concludes the first block of the course. In the next block, I will try to show you some more relevant problems that will pop up in your day-to-day -day work.